Excellent. Welcome everybody back to Comic Con. Everybody happy to be here in person? Way, way too long. And we were thinking that there is no better way to celebrate the triumphant return of Comic Con than a panel talking about Comic Con and what this event in particular means not only to us as fans, but to the sort of entire spectrum of the entertainment world, the publishing world, comics, fandom in general. Um, and so um, I'm really looking forward to a great conversation. Um, all of us on stage have explored the topic of Comic-Con in our books, photographs, podcasts, websites, um, all kinds of different media. Comic-Con has been an inspiration um, for all of us, um, and we all have a personal relationship with it. Uh, my name is Rob Sopwitz. I am a, a writer and sayer of things about comics. I write for Forbes, for ICB2, Publishers Weekly, and I wrote a book a few years ago called Comic-Con and the Business of Pop Culture, which uh, makes me the guy who wrote a book about Comic-Con, um, which is a good thing to have done. <laughs> um, but I am sharing the stage with people who have an incredibly long and illustrious history with the event. We have somebody here on stage who was present at the earliest planning meetings before there even was the idea of a Comic-Con. Before that, right, 1969? And then uh, we have somebody on stage who has one of the very, very few people who has been to every single Comic-Con from the beginning down to the present day. We have somebody on stage who this is their first Comic-Con. Uh. <laughs> and, and, somebody, and somebody who's just about in the middle. Like I, I think I've been to now exactly half of the Comic-Cons. Um, so we've got a really good, interesting group. Let me um, let you guys introduce yourselves, starting uh, to my immediate left with Jackie Estrada. Uh, let everybody know who you are and what you have, what you have done related, related to Comic Con. Okay, well, this is going to take like 20 minutes because I've been <laughs> Comic Cons. But to give you just a little bit of background, uh, I graduated from San Diego State in 1968 with a journalism degree, and uh, I had been a comics fan starting in the mid 60s and while I was in college I started a freelance writing career writing articles for magazines and things about, about pop culture and I also studied photography when I was in journalism school. So in 1970 this event happened at the U.S. Grant Hotel that was a comic convention and I course I've had to go check it out and I went and then I went back the next year and the next year and the next year and then I thought you know I'm a freelance writer I should do an article about this event because uh, it's just drawing so many famous people and uh, it's such an important event so I pitched to Rolling Stone magazine an article about Comic-Con and the editor said you yeah, know that sounds really interesting so I contacted uh, Richard Butner, who was the vice chair of Comic-Con, to get some background information, and he said, why don't you come to one of our planning meetings um, so that you can see what we really do. So I went to the planning meeting, and I think this was 1975, and uh, during the meeting they said, you know, we need like a really good PR person to write articles about the show and get the word out and everything. And Jackie, you're a journalist and write about, <laughs> you know, these things. So I suddenly became the PR person for Comic-Con. <laughs> and in subsequent years, uh, 77, 78, I edited the souvenir book. And then I went back to my photography and I had a studio where I developed my own film and pictures and I was the official photographer for Comic-Con from 78 to 82. But I also, I think I started taking photos in 74. So I have uh, not only been to all the shows but chronicled them uh, photographically and uh, also as having been the co-author of the 40th anniversary book, and then I have two, two books of photos taken at Comic-Con and other conventions. So that's 
in a nutshell, <laughs> my background. Terrific. Thank you. So, so Mike, your association with Comic Con goes back as far as it is possible to go back. Can you all speak closer to the mic, please? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Move it up to your mic. The mask. Yeah, the mask is a problem. Sorry about that. Um, okay, good. Um, so, Mike, sure. you have been involved with Comic Con for as long as it is possible to have done that, and your involvement even continues down to the present day where you've been documenting and collecting information about the original Comic Cons and making that information available on websites and things like that. Tell us a little about your, your history with the event and how it continues to influence um, what you've been doing creatively and with your subsequent events. Uh, okay, so in um, 1969, uh, a fan named Shell Dorf who had helped put on a convention in Detroit called the Detroit Triple Fanfare with Jerry Bales, who is often considered the father of modern comic fandom. Uh, they put this on a multimedia convention of comics, science fiction, fantasy, and uh, films. So when his parents decided to retire from their Detroit business and move out to somewhere warm, they ended up in San Diego, the Claremont community of San Diego, and Shell helped them move and when he got here and he saw sunny California in 1969, he never went back. And so his parents had a spare room and he moved in there and um, he, he made, was able to make contact with five local fans. I was one of them. And we met um, Shell in his parents' apartment in Claremont in 1969 and he pitched us the idea of doing a comic con and um, you know, we weren't sure about him because he was pretty old, you know, he was like 35, 36. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we, but he was able to arrange for us to uh, meet Jack Kirby, who had also just that year moved to Irvine from New York. And so we figured, gosh, we can meet Jack Kirby, you know, sure, we could do anything. So, so we started Comic Con and had our first event was a one day Minicon uh, in the basement of the U.S. Grand Hotel in March of 1970. Uh, Peter Jones over here actually attended as a young kid. His mom dropped him off down there. So uh, anyway, so we we uh, you know had had Comic Con at the Grand the first year, the second year at UCSD, um, and then they, after the UCSD convention, the uh, the uh, the administration. Uh, said they wished us well as long as we never came back to UCSD. <laughs> so um, after that, we ended up at the El Cortez. And for most of the rest of the 70s, it was at the Cortez. And for a lot of people, that's kind of a golden age of Comic-Con. Uh, in 2009, when there was the celebration of the 40th Comic-Con, uh, that, that Jackie's book was done for, a very, very great book, um, I found a lot of people were talking about um, you know, how they missed the old comic cons that were mostly about comics and they were a lot smaller and at least in people's memory they were mostly about comics but um, but it was, it was smaller and more intimate and they were, you know, there were some complaints that well, you know, it wouldn't be impossible to actually put on a small event like that for people that, you know, missed that experience and uh, uh, or ones who had never experienced it and would like to. So I started an event in 2012 called San Diego Comic Fest. <laughs> and, uh, still continues. Uh, both Rob and Jackie have been guests and, and uh, continues. I also started a website called ComicConMemories.com. I had the uh, tapes from the first Comic Con, first three-day con of August 1970 digitized. And, it's on there for streaming, anybody who wants to listen to it. And uh, also Alan Light, who did a, an LP vinyl record of the 1975 con, and gave me permission to digitize that and put it on the website. And there's a number of articles and, and um, you know, uh, photos and, and, and whatnot on that website. Very cool. The uh, website is alive. It's got a lot of uh, interesting stuff on it. But if you want all of that history condensed, into a epic six-hour podcast. <laughs> well, our final panelist has you covered on that. Matt, why don't you tell them what you've been uh, what you've been doing relative to Comic Con? 
I just won a raffle and got to sit here. I don't know. <laughs> but no. Um, first of all, I do. I do want to be clear. Uh, this is not my first Comic Con. I did come once before in 2016, but it was a very unique experience. It was a little bit of kind of the backdoor experience in more ways than one. Uh, I was working on a documentary about television's Mark Summers uh, that some people might remember from Nickelodeon's Double Dare or Unwrapped, and uh, it was the 30th anniversary of Double Dare, so I was actually here for that. Uh, but I was working the entire time, so it was a very different kind of experience. Uh, so this is technically my second uh, Comic-Con. Uh, but uh, I think uh, it was about, it was around 2014, I was working on a book about so-called nerd and geek culture, uh, something that I've been very interested in most of my life. I've written books about Nickelodeon. It's one of the ways I met Mark Summers. I wrote a book about uh, The Simpsons, Springfield Confidential with Mike Reese, one of the two people who's written for the show since it started. And very much like Jackie uh, and a few other people that are probably in this room, Rob, for example, uh, I've written a lot of books and articles about pop culture history. And at a point, it just seemed like it would make sense to do something about fandom or nostalgia, or again, as we called it, nerd or geek culture. I honestly don't remember how this happened, but my Comic-Con interviewee was a woman named Wendy All who was one of the early committee members and was very involved in the early days of Comic-Con. And we just stayed friendly over the years after that book came out, uh, actually through China, uh, through an odd series of circumstances. Um, a couple of years ago, literally about, I think, two, two and a half, uh, I was talking with my agent. We decided to do a book about Comic-Con, an oral history, where I talked to a bunch of Wendy's friends. Wendy was nice enough to introduce me to a lot of people over the phone and email, including the two people here. And I will say, actually, Jackie is very humble as much as she's done when I asked her what her identification would be for the book. It was contributor, but she, as anyone knows here, she's done far more than that. Uh, but I did get to interview Jackie, I got to interview Mike, and I interviewed about 50 other people who were either involved uh, in Comic-Con in the early days and a few uh, celebrity guests, if you will, Kevin Smith, Neil Gaiman, the Russo brothers, Felicia Day, Bruce Campbell, uh, a number of other people who kind of talked about Comic-Con and how it's changed over the years, and we went even all the way back to the, to the late 30s. Uh, again, any historians here would know that the first uh, real convention is considered the 1939 World Con or Science Fiction Convention uh, in New York. Uh, we talked a lot about zines and H.P. Lovecraft, H.G. Wells, and so forth, and really tracked it all the way until today. Uh, and ended up doing it as a podcast series, or as I like to say, an audio documentary uh, for SiriusXM and Stitcher. Uh, but don't let that confuse you, as it seemed to have confused a lot of people. It is available everywhere for free, so Pandora, Spotify, wherever you would get your podcast. And it just launched this last summer, um, and uh, technically the first time I'm announcing this, but we're also now expanding it into a book with Fantagraphics as well, uh, called See You at San Diego, which will be coming out next year. Uh, you might have seen some of the postcards we've been distributing. And uh, that will be a way for us to get a lot more of the material that we gathered. Because as uh, Rob said, the show is only about seven hours and it includes archival materials. Mike was nice enough to donate to us. SDSU and Pam Jackson, some of the people over there and a few other places. Uh, and some narration by Brink Stevens, who was another person who was very involved in the con early on. Dave Stevens, widow, among other things. Um, and uh, so this will be a lot more of the material, a lot more of the stories going much more in depth into the people who are involved in Comic-Con and so forth. But the podcast is live, it's out there. Um, and as Rob so nicely said, it really does condense kind of the whole story of Comic-Con with all the different people talking, including some of these celebrities and discussing kind of their experiences as well. And that's called Comic-Con Begins. The book is See You at San Diego and hopefully that'll come out next year depending on supply chain demand issues. So, um, and as I said, I, I also have been writing a lot about Comic-Con, so I had, I had been a comics fan when I was a kid, and I went to some of the early conventions, not San Diego Con, but like Creation Convention on the East Coast um, in, the, in the 70s as a little kid, and as I got older and I got sort of, I drifted away and then I got back into conventions, uh, you know, I decided to reconnect to the, to the source of creative inspiration that comics had always given me. So I, came, I started coming to Comic-Con in the late 90s, uh, in the very last days when it was still possible um, to walk up and just buy a ticket and, and come in, and kind of witnessed firsthand this transformation of Comic-Con from being a small, small-ish, like a large gathering by the standards of fan conventions, but a 
relatively moderate sized convention of 30 or 40,000 people um, ballooning into this mega event that proceeded to eat the entire world of entertainment and pop culture whole through the 2000s for a variety of reasons. And uh, in my other work as a, as a futurist and as a, as a technology writer and somebody who was sort of looking at big trends, I thought this is really interesting how all of the things that, that publishing and entertainment and technology and marketing and all of these fields, things that they were trying to do desperately in the, in the mid 20 in the late aughts, let's like say, around you know, uh, connecting with fans and social media marketing and technology and digital and all of this stuff, the comics industry was figuring out and the Comic Con itself had served as kind of this petri dish where all of these cultures would merge and interact and all of this great stuff would come out of that. And the process by which the, this event particularly became the fulcrum of this gigantic universe of you know, billions of dollars worth of entertainment that now is everywhere um, is kind of incredible to me. And the fact that you, know, like you could walk down the street anywhere in the world and you know, people know who Iron Man, like they know Tony Stark as Iron Man. Like, that to me is just like, that's, it's been a, you know, it's been the, that has been the case for a while, but it's been kind of interesting to me. So how that happened, how we went from being this culture of fans, collectors, nerds, individual enthusiasts into this giant thing is not just like the folklore of our tribe, it's actually kind of an important story um, in the economic history of the last 50 years. And it's a story um, particular to this event. Um, and because Comic-Con, as, as you guys will tell us, was not the first convention of this sort. And it's certainly not the only one like it these days. I think there are Comic-Cons in just about every city. But there's only one San Diego Comic-Con. And what makes this convention a special place? What, what makes it, the, you know, the, when the doors fly open, that we will fly down here on Thanksgiving, you know, in the middle of a pandemic to be with our people. <laughs> That's, you know, that's, that's pretty dedicated. So um, uh, I would ask, uh, Mike, what was it in the early days that animated you guys? Like, what is the, um, some of the, I guess, culture and uh, things that you guys were trying as young fans um, that, that you imprinted on this event that you may even still recognize in the event today? Well, <clears throat> I think, uh, I mean, I've thought a lot about why, why San Diego, why is the San Diego Convention been so, uh, why has it been so successful and long-lived and it's, you know, the continuity of it since we started in 1969, it's continued down to the present day. And I think a big part of it is that it's always been non-profit. Um, it's always been fans who got together because they loved this stuff and wanted to share the experience uh, with other fans. I know when we started, uh, if you were like a comic or science fiction fan, you were kind of a weirdo and people looked down on you. And even science fiction fans looked down on us as comic fans. <laughs> so we had a chance at a convention to get together with people who valued the same things we did. And so for three days, we weren't weirdos, we were normal and we got to, to hang out with the other people who viewed things the same way we did and valued the same things, and we had a chance to meet you know, the creators. And it's funny, too, because I thought, you know, in those days, I mean, we ended up a bunch of long-haired kids and teenagers, um, but, and those were the days of the generation gap, and don't trust anyone over 30 and all that. But when we met somebody like Jack Kirby, who seemed very old to us, um, we, it was, it was like a worshipful experience. He was a wonderful person and, and we didn't think anything about him being old. Um, you know, and he was so considerate to us, uh, spent so much time talking to us and the same thing with the other creators. And so it was an opportunity for people from any, any background, um, any age, um, to, to get together and share the enjoyment. And I think that nonprofit spirit continues. I mean, Comic-Con obviously exchange is so huge and there's a professional staff putting it on as there has to be. You, you couldn't have an event like this with all volunteers. But um, it, I think the, the nonprofit spirit is still evident in, in Comic-Con and really makes it different from any other event. 
One of the narratives of Comic-Con over the years is that, you know, while it started out as this pure event around love of comics and science fiction and things like that, that, that it became, you know, sort of tainted with all of this Hollywood and show business and all of this stuff, um, and that uh, the event today is unrecognizable from, from the way that it started. Jackie, tell, tell, what, tell us why those people are wrong. <laughs> oh, don't you love hearing, it's not about comics anymore. And the, the very first convention had uh, Ray Bradbury, Flory Ackerman, Jack Kirby. Um, by the time I got to 1974, it was Frank Capra, Charles Schultz, it, the synergy of all of these elements coming together in San Diego. I have heard so many stories of people who would never otherwise have met in life because of their different kinds of careers, meeting and ending up collaborating on things coming from different fields and different areas of popular arts. And, you know, what people really comment about the, in the 70s was that how intimate at the El Cortez was that you could go out by the pool and hang out with, you know, major national cartoonists, um, Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, uh, Ted Sturgeon, um, radio, I mean, t TV horror hosts, uh, just such a spectrum of kinds of things. And it was just, uh, not segregated in any way. Everything was melding and uh, interacting. And so to say that it was, you know, mostly comics and had a little bit of this or a little bit of that, I mean, Disney had Condor Man movie masks that they were giving out uh, in, what was it, 78 or, you know. I mean, there was always that. And then when Star Wars uh, came out, that, brought another whole audience that came in, and that would be our longest lines was for the Star Wars stuff. And then uh, manga and anime fandom brought another whole element, which included, yes, people wore masquerade costumes and there was cosplay, but um, the uh, in the 80s, I think, cosplay went up a whole notch when you started getting on with the the anime related costumes and so that there's just so many elements that come together into the show that um, I would say it's a big tent with a bunch of little tents in it but you can wander from one tent to the other so if you're an anime fan you can go over to gaming um, if you're a movie fan you can go buy a piece of original art by you know a comic book artist and then um, the underground element came in in the late 70s and the uh, National Lampoon cartoonists and you know, a lot of alt and indie people. It just so many streams fed into this uh, ocean. <laughs> Very cool. By the way, I'm like skipping around on these uh, slides, but I'm just trying to put up stuff that is, uh, that is relevant as, as the people are talking. So um, if I go fast past something, I will probably come back and hit it again. Um, so Matt, you spoke to you know dozens and dozens of people of various generations and various experiences with Comic Con for your project. What were some of the common themes that you heard them say in terms of what made this event special? What connected them to the to this uh, culture, particularly at this at this specific convention? Um, a lot of what Mike and uh, Jackie were already saying, definitely, to be sure. In fact, the first thing I was thinking, if, if I had been asked the question first, is what Mike said. As far as it being nonprofit, I think that that's something that's very special about San Diego. Um, you know, the fact that it was literally created, uh, aside from a very small handful, maybe three or four people, by children. Barry Alfonso was 12 years old. I mean, these were people who had to be driven to places by their parents. And they were not gophers. They were not getting coffee, they were running Comic-Con. They were putting it together. They were bringing Jack Kirby down. They were bringing Flory Ackerman down. They were putting this together. They were connecting with media in San Diego. They were connecting with local radio. They were putting up flyers at a time when there was not comic book shops, which is something that a lot of people forget about. Uh, another little plug uh, for both the book and the podcast series. There's a lot about kind of the history of that and the fact that even what they were doing was pretty unique. 
as Mike said, and a few other people did say this, that even the science fiction fans kind of looked down on comic book fans, and it was hard to get comic books. It was a little difficult to get comic books. There was no Amazon, but there was also barely any comic book shops, really, a couple in LA. Um, so it was a group of fans. It was a group of kids that really loved this stuff. They were not getting paid. Uh, they were borrowing money. People were putting things on credit cards, like Ken Kruger and Richard Elf, who was a comic book dealer, himself also a kid. Uh, and so it was a real passion project, and that was very special, and that has very clearly uh, passed along through as, as the administration has changed, and as various people like Jackie and someone Mike and a few others, some people in the room I see here who are you know, tertiarily involved in different ways, have kept that alive. Um, uh, so that's a very important aspect of it. And I think a lot of people have said this to me, and I've noticed this, this convention that we're at right now seems very special. And a lot of people said, I'm very lucky that this is technically my first con, because this is very much what it was like in the earlier days. There's not big media here. There's not big Hollywood representation here. People aren't here looking for a big celebrity to see if they could find Johnny Depp or Tom Cruise. People are here because they love comic books and they love science fiction and they love anime and they wanna come and not only purchase but talk about it, share it with each other, wear their costumes. People are here right now, as you just said, Rob, during Thanksgiving, during a pandemic because they really love this and they're not here to broadcast something necessarily on NBC or CNN or whatever it might be. There's obviously some media representation here, but a lot of people have made it very clear to me, including some of the original folks that have gotten a chance to actually meet in person for the first time after interviewing and talking with them, that this was very much what it was like. So for any of you also who are here for the first time or one of the only times you are here apparently, as I've learned and as I've seen and as I've heard from all the interviews, at a very special Comic-Con and that is really for and about the fans. And I think that's really amazing. And you know, there's a few other things I could say too, how important San Diego was, the fact that people were coming from the East Coast, from New York, at a time when a lot of the comics industry was over there. It was a nice vacation for people to come down here, a nice vacation away from Los Angeles for people to come down here. It was a place to go to SeaWorld and bring the kids and enjoy the weather especially since it was during the summer, which was different than New York, which New York Comic Con did come out first, um, but San Diego was a very special place. It was laid back. It wasn't a very big city at the time. It grew a lot, in part because of Comic Con, um, and that was very special as well. And you know, the last thing I'll say is I think that Jackie's right too, that uh, there was obviously, you know, although not the big representation that we see in some of the latter year Comic Cons, but you know, people forget there was a, or not no, there was a special section for Star Trek as early as 1973. Frank Capra came in the early 70s. Frank Capra, he has nothing to do with comic books. So it was about bringing together people who were into anime and people who were into martial arts. Chuck Norris came in 1975. You know, what does that have to do with comics? Um, so it was about fandom. It was about people who really loved it and nobody was getting paid and nobody thought this would be this big thing. And I will say too, but I did ask that question of a lot of the founders, including the people here. I said, what do you guys think about the fact that <laughs> you're not getting a part of this huge frenemies or fame or whatever it is? A lot of them, you don't even know their names. Every single one of them, every single one of them, this is in the podcast, you can hear it, say, you know, they didn't even think about it. They're just really happy as per the mission of Comic-Con that we're all here right now, that this is happening 50 plus years later of a bunch of kids who are really, really into comics and science fiction and a little later some other things too, and made this all happen and made us all come here. That's very special. That's not corporate. That's not big media. It's a group of friends, many of whom went to high school with each other and are still friends today. And uh, I've met these people in person. I've gone out with them. A few of them are here. And I've stayed very close friends with a lot of them over these last two years. They really care about this. They really mean it. This isn't, this isn't a PR hoax. This isn't a marketing thing. It happened to become this bigger thing because I think Hollywood and such said, wow, this is amazing, look what they're doing, and came down. And now we're all here, and that's what it is. It's very special, it really is. We're very lucky to be here right now. was coming from the East Coast. Well, a key thing there was that comics pros from the East Coast 
came to San Diego and went back and said, you know, we got to get out of New York in July and go to San Diego. And so a lot of uh, big name comics pros came to San Diego, even though they weren't guests or anything. They just wanted to be part of what everybody was talking about. So that was an element to it. And then also I just want to bring up, it's Comic-Con International, partly because we had Mobius, we had um, all of the Filipino cartoonists, we had, uh, in 1980, Tezuka and a whole Japanese contingency of uh, manga and, and anime creators, and so the, the international aspect goes way back too, and just uh, adds another whole element of people coming from all over the world wanting to be at this show. Uh, that's very interesting. And what, another point that Matthew raised was the relationship that you, and, and Jackie touched on it as well, is the relationship between this event and the city of, of San Diego. And this is something that if you certainly if you listen to the podcast or look at any of the uh, other materials, Mike, uh, what, what was it, I mean, what was it about the community here? Like, why, why here? Why not, why not LA? Why not, you know, why not somewhere else? Why, why San Diego as the, as the ground zero for all of this stuff? Um, I would say it's because Sheldorf moved here in 1969 and, and Jack Kirby moved to Irvine in 1969 and Ken Kruger moved to Ocean Beach in 1969 and Richard Alf had just come out with his ads, first ads in Marvel Comics which allowed um, Shell to contact him after Barry had recommended it and Richard had the money through his business to actually finance the early Comic Cons. Um, it was just, it, it's one thing that I think there's always been about Comic Con is it, it's always had the, the people it needed at the right time. I mean, the right people at the, at the right time and it just, it, it just happened. Um, there was our group um, that it worked. Um, there were different groups that succeeded us. Then, you know, John Rogers and uh, Faye Desmond uh, when Comic-Con really started growing and really needed the kind of really excellent professional management that it needed to, to grow and survive, they were there. And Starting so, in 1984 was the first time that the con was not, well really 85, was not run all volunteer and only had a post office box. There was no office, there was no phone number. Nothing, it was all volunteers. It was in 85 that um, Faye was hired to be the general manager and, and John Rogers was like to be president and everything you know, started falling into place then because you had the two elements to balance. One is running it professionally with uh, people doing the business side of the thing and then the other side was the all volunteer committed fans and, and there's been a balancing act between those two things ever since. Um, yeah, that's, that's interesting, and I, I would like to get into this question of like the transition points in the convention, but I'd just like to observe that uh, in things that uh, Matt and, and Mike were saying. So before I wrote uh, Comic-Con and the Business of Pop Culture, I had written several other business books, and the one that immediately preceded that was called Young World Rising, which was about a completely unrelated topic. It was about how young entrepreneurs in emerging economies like Asia, Africa, Latin America were creating new businesses and new technology innovations that we in the first world would not have thought of because we don't have the same needs. And there's something about the, the kind of innovations that you make when you don't have much, you know, and it's like you've got to make it work and you have to work with the, with the media environment that you've got. You've got to use your mimeograph machines and hand out things door to door and paste up ads in fanzines and stuff like that to build, that those are the kind of innovations that stick, you know, that it's built to last when it's built um, so solid that it can withstand even those kind of rugged conditions. And until this conversation, I had never actually made the connections between uh, that, that, that aspect, of that piece of uh, work that I had done prior to getting this involved in Comic-Con, and um, that is something I definitely recognize in how Comic-Con was created in the early days, and it uh, might have something to do with the longevity. Um, I'd like to, um, so of course Comic-Con has changed dramatically over the years. Um, uh, can, uh, 
first to Jackie, can you think of any big turning points where uh, you know you could feel that things were, were shifting in a different direction, um, that the event was getting bigger, that it was becoming a big thing? Well, the most obvious one was moving to this convention center 30 years ago in 1991 um, because it, I think it upped the professionalism of the whole thing. I, I've told a few people this story where when the, the TV stations would come and cover Comic-Con back when it was in the old convention center, it would, every single reporter would go, look at this comic book that your mother threw away. Guess what, that's worth $500. <laughs> When we moved to this facility and the exhibit hall, the first thing you saw when you walked in was the DC booth, and it was a trade show booth worthy of professional trade shows in any other industry, and it was dubbed Wayne's World because Bob Wayne had been the one in charge of it, and the reporters would come in and they would stand in front of that, and there's no old comic books sitting there to be sold, and they're, you know, well, we're here at Comic-Con, and uh, it, the kind of perception of it as being, you know, going from being a, a fan event to being a professional event, I think, was just subtle, but did cause a change because we attracted a lot more um, exhibitors and companies and, and uh, you know, Yes, some Hollywood people, but also book publishers that wouldn't normally do a comic event and stuff like that, you know, wanted to be part of it because they wanted to access the audience that we were attracting. I, I would also add that the expansion of this convention center, probably 02, 03, something like that, um, that I, when I first started coming in 1997, it, it was in the convention center, but it was only halls A through C, which felt pretty big, like that felt like a big comic convention. And gradually, as they expanded the convention center, they would open up one or two more halls or something like that. And I remember the year, whatever it was, 02 or 03, when they had the whole thing, halls A through G, contiguous as the show floor. And people came in, and you could see them gasp. You could see like people were just visibly overwhelmed at how gigantic this had become. And it felt like it had, a, had achieved some, some escape velocity. Um, in that in that respect, um, Matt, in your in your research, did you uh, what were some of the what were some of the turning points that that people mentioned? Uh, yeah, uh, I did want to say real quick too uh, that I really like what you said, Rob, and I and I know that was echoing a little bit of what I had said about putting up flyers and so forth, and everyone kind of doing it themselves and learning on the fly, teaching themselves how to do it. Many of the people who were involved indeed became publicists and writers and creatives and talked a lot about how learning how to do Comic-Con when they were in their teens is why they do what they do today. Uh, Best-selling science fiction authors and so forth, they had to learn how to put on Comic-Con and that taught them how to do their careers of today. Uh, so I think that that's really important that there was a DIY spirit. And one of the questions that I asked a lot of the people was, what you guys are doing seemed a lot of like what was going on in New York at the time at places like CBGB's for example the origins of punk rock, the origins of Riot Girl a little bit later, the origins of hip hop, um, these groups of people that were kind of outsiders, that kind of didn't have a lot of money, didn't have a lot of resources, were really creating something uh, for themselves that they really enjoyed because they kind of wanted to do this and they wanted to share it. And then whoops, it worked out really well and it became this much bigger thing. And as Mike just said and as Jackie's talked about, they were very fortunate that people like John and Faye and others came in to kind of make it into Comic-Con International. And I will say that it's a pattern that I saw when I was writing the book about Nickelodeon. Uh, it was in some ways the pattern of the uh, book I wrote on Simpsons. If you read about the history of MTV, Saturday Night Live, I mean, this goes on and on of this group of people who no one's paying attention, there's no money, there's no pressure, no one knows what they're doing, they're just doing something they really like. And whoops, it turns out a whole lot of other people like it too. And suddenly it becomes this much bigger thing. So I really appreciate it. We did, we did talk about this and there were people who specifically made connections between what was going on here 
And a couple years later, but around the same time, punk rock and CBGBs and such, uh, you know, in New York at the same time. And I think that that's very important. And you could see, to go back to your point about the different touch points that happened, pop culture history and Comic-Con were really paralleling each other in an almost shocking way. You just said, you know, things really started to change in 1985. For good or ill, Shell Dorf left in 1984, which was a big turning point, obviously. We actually have an entire episode about Shell Dorf in our podcast, and for good reason. I won't say too much more than that, uh, but he was a bit of a controversial character. Um, but it's, in, it's interesting that he left in 1984, and that Comic-Con got started getting a lot bigger in 1985. I'm sure there are a lot of people in this room who are aware. There have been many articles, I think even books, on how important 1984 was for pop culture. Uh, and a lot of other things. The Macintosh comes out in 1984. Uh, there are a lot of you know big pop culture movies that came out in 1984. We talked about it a little bit in the podcast as well. And then all of a sudden things are changing. And then as, as Jackie and Rob were talking about, things started to change again in the 90s at a certain time when things were happening in Hollywood and pop culture was changing again. Technology is really starting to move into the mix in the early 2000s. Con, the con starts to expand even more. The convention center is expanding. It's very interesting to watch how pop culture history, if you're paying attention to those kinds of things, are parallel in Comic-Con. And I would say that's for two reasons. One is it was affecting Comic-Con and the people who were here, but also Comic-Con was affecting pop culture because everybody was gathering here. You know, there is something to think about this as a convention, almost as a sort of business convention of fans. And people were coming, as Jackie said, from all over the world and they were bringing back what they were learning from each other. It was a tribe of people who were teaching each other things and figuring things out and going back into the world and making those impactful changes in movies and in books and in video games and in technology. There's even connections to what was going on in Silicon Valley, only a few hundred miles north and what was going on here. Uh, you know, with people like Steve Wozniak, who were sort of, you know, in the scene a little bit and so forth. Matt Groening, who would come to Comic-Con. He did some early ads for Apple. You can look it up. You can see it. Uh, so there was a lot of connections going on. Yeah. <laughs> but even as far as ads for Apple, yeah. So the, the fact that Comic-Con and pop culture history parallel, I think is very important. And even down to the 1984 thing, I, I, can't, I really can't get over it if you really look into that more. Sheldorf leaves in 1984, the con starts to really change in 1985, and anyone here probably knows 1984 was a very important year for pop culture. So I find that really interesting, and that happened a lot more times as well along the route. Well, I can't emphasize how important it was uh, for John Rogers to have been the president because um, the president is the one who, he, he dealt with hotels, he dealt with the convention center, he dealt with the, Police department. He, you know, you have to have the right mentality to deal with all of these aspects. Uh, dealing with lawyers and that sort of thing. And just a, a little story: um, the Comic Con didn't have an office. David Scroge, who had been programming director at Comic Con, uh, was an agent for art artists, and he had a little office downtown San Diego on Fifth Avenue. And he said to John, he said, you know, there's, a, there's an office space here that's opening up, but maybe Comic-Con should have an office. And John said, well, how much is it? He said, well, the rent's $100 a month. And John's like, oh, I'm really gonna have to think about that. <laughs> so he, he was very uh, just meticulous about all of the professional business aspects of the show that I can't imagine anybody else who actually wanted the job, so. And th this is very, uh, again, talking about like things that were present in the early DNA of the event that have held on. Uh, last week I did an interview with David Glanzer, who's the current uh, Chief Marketing and Strategy Officer, um, was at one point actually scheduled to be on this panel because his job is telling the story of Comic-Con on a day-to-day basis, but one of the things that he said to me, because we all know the last two years have been pretty awful for the entire events industry, but certainly for this event, which has lost two Comic-Cons and two WonderCons, um, and he says, uh, you know, we're a very financially conservative organization. He said it just that way, like it, that the, the stewardship, that when you start off 
scripting pennies and trying to get into, you know, find a dorm, uh, you know, that'll take your convention because you got thrown out of your previous, uh, you know, spot. And then, you know, all of that experience leads this organization to be very resilient. Um, I think we can see the evidence in the last few days that, you know, Comic-Con has come roaring back. Um, and I think that some of the, the resilience there, um, you know, is, is, comes from the, from the long heritage of the success. Um, I think we are, we're getting down to the end here. I was hoping to take some questions. I don't think we're going to have time to do that, but we are all going to be around and we're um, available on various social media and things like that. And I'd like to just quickly let the panel go down and talk about what are your current projects and um, where can people find you or, uh, you know, um, for, for, for more information, where, where can people look? Well, I'm, I'm an employee of Comic-Con. I run the Eisner Awards and have done that for my, since 1990, as I said. So that's, that's my um, uh, current status. But um, my two books, uh, Comic Book People from the 1970s and 80s, 1990s, are available on Amazon. They're available at exhibitapress.com. Um, and uh, if anybody wants to buy one from me now, I don't want to carry these around anymore. It's <laughs> sold. <laughs> 25 bucks a piece. Uh, but they're also available at the, the Comic-Con Museum uh, gift shop, as is the Comic-Con 40th book is available there, although I think you can get it cheaper on Amazon, but I can say that. Um, <laughs> so that's... That's my uh, advertisement. It really is a great book, by the way. We actually mention it in every podcast episode at the end. It was basically our Bible. We could not have done a lot of what we did without that particular book. Mike Towery's Comic-Con Memories was extremely helpful, too, and the archive of stuff that we were able to bring in was very helpful. Um, but there was there was so much information in Jackie's 40th uh, anniversary souvenir book. I highly recommend it. It's very, very readable, too. It reads like almost a novel. There were so many great people who were involved in the making of it. And the cover alone by Sergio Aragones is worth the value of the thing. It's fantastic. Sergio, one of the great, one of the great figures of the con. Also, many of these photographs that you've been seeing throughout this presentation are taken from Jackie's two uh, two books of photos and um, from the archive. And to add on to the Comic-Con book, that, that um, is also an almanac of useful information about the show with like attendance numbers and stuff like that. I actually keep it by my desk when I write about Comic-Con because that's, um, that's the place to get um, authoritative info. Can you my, talk about the museum? Yeah, um, can somebody talk about the museum? Well, the Comic-Con Museum is in Belleville Park. The, it officially opened uh, yesterday and will be open continuously from now on. And they <laughs> the grand, grand opening will be during Comic Con in July, but uh, for now there are actually uh, six exhibits already up. There's a Charles Adams exhibit, uh, History of uh, Archie Comics, a Gene Roddenberry exhibit, uh, Pac Man, so it's, it's well worth it. Uh, there's available, you can buy tickets to go in, you can become a member at various levels and that gives you various perks. So, you know, just Google Comic-Con Museum and you can find all the info. Mike, you wanna tell us uh, once again about uh, Comic-Con Memories and also Comic Fest? Um, yeah, so uh, ComicConMemories.com, ShelldorfTribute.com, and KenKrugerTribute.com all have uh, material on them about the early Comic Cons. There's some audio, a lot of photos. Um, I haven't updated them for quite a while because I got involved in creating some, the San Diego Comic Fest. I recently retired from working on that. Um, so maybe I'll have time to go back and, and start adding some more of my archive and stuff to the, to the website. So anyone interested in the, the Comic Fest experience, which is kind of like the, the old Comic Cons were when they were small, um, sdcomicfest.org is the website. Um, they just got dates uh, confirmed, so that should be uh, announced soon on the, on the website. And again, that's uh, sdcomicfest.org. Uh, Peter Jones here is on the board, and I, as I mentioned, he, as a kid, was at the very first event we had in March of 1970, the one-day Minicon. 
and Matt Dunford back here is uh, uh, the chairman of uh, Comic Fest. So. <laughs> <laughs> the Emmer Humble Chairman of, 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 of It's a lot of sugar. That is, a, yes, a lot of sugar. Um, and then one other, one other thing to plug on, on uh, Mike's site is that, um, like somebody like me that grew up as a fan of Jack Kirby and never got to meet him, um, you have recordings of Jack talking and giving keynote addresses here. And once you hear Jack Kirby's voice and you read his work, Thinking in that, hearing that voice in your head, a lot of Jack Kirby stuff makes a lot more sense. And what, uh, before we stop, one last thing. Uh, Matt, where can, where can people find, uh, once again, on the podcast of your book? Uh, uh, yes, uh, you can uh, find any, uh, anything that I've been doing and up to. I'm working on a lot of different projects all the time, including a middle grade reader called So Good to Be Bad That Your Children Might Like. Um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, yeah, it's called Comic Con Begins. Don't forget the hyphen, just like in the real Comic Con. Uh, it is available everywhere, so just look up Comic Con Begins. It's free, and it is an audio documentary, so it's not like a bunch of just chattering or whatnot. It really is like a documentary with original music and the archival stuff and some of the amazing material that Mike gave us and others. Um, so just look up Comic Con Begins. The book is coming out through Fanographics uh, this next year. It's called See You at San Diego. It'll be available on uh, Amazon or at bookstores and things like that. I usually like to say, please go to your local bookstore and support them. But these days, uh, we all have to bow down to uh, Overlord Bezos. So I guess you should buy it on Amazon as well. So Thank you, guys. Uh, we yeah. got to make some, make some room for the other panel. My name is Rob Salfwood. You can follow me at Rob Salf. Thank you all. Have a great rest of your day.